for Millie Vanilli and the, uh, the worship music. You know, that's probably coming soon, now that I think about it, if it's not already happening. Already, especially all that jumping around garbage that's out there. You, you know they ain't jumping around and, and still having breath. At least I wouldn't be anyway. I ain't going to have no breath in me if I'm running around like that. I went to a... Uh, Lord forgive me for going to it, but I went to a Toby Mac concert when I was a uh, when I was a teenager. Uh, they they were out there cutting flips and carrying on. I'm like, my goodness, that's that's what it's like to be saved. You know, you cut flips and carry on. Not really. Oh man. So this morning we were late for uh, late for Sunday school because somebody thought it was a good idea not to click save on their sermon notes so they didn't come over from my computer to my iPad like normal. So I had to turn around. We uh, we'd left the house. A good thing we weren't very far away. And I could just hear the annoyance in Brittany's head. I could, I could, like I was getting a little PTSD from it because like, I know I've done that to her before recently actually. And it, it almost destroyed our entire lives because, you know, pregnancy hormones mixed with being late with someone that's got a lot of anxiety about being late. You know, it just wasn't good. But this morning, had to turn around. I literally, I walk into my building. I go over to do, 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 on the computer, looked at my phone. It was there, ready to go. All I had to do was a little do, 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 one of them before I left. Everything would have been fine. But now it's saved, and now it's here, and good thing about it in the church age, once saved, always saved, so it's going to be on my computer all the time. So um, we're um, over um, the past several weeks, we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and now we're finally into it's got to be my most quoted uh, verses of uh, Scripture ever. And, and I want you to understand something. I probably read these verses or say these verses maybe a, close to 500 to 1,000 times a month. And I still don't have this passage memorized. That's wild to me to know that I say it that much and literally read it straight out of Scripture that much. And it's like there's a mental block in my head that doesn't allow me to memorize it so that I have to depend on exactly what the Scripture says and read it. Now, I've come to that conclusion. I think that's what it is. Because every time I read this Scripture, I turn to it because, it's, one, it's just that important. But two, I think it's so important that God has just blocked me from it so that I would read it straight out of His book so that people would know that it's come from Him and not from me. That's the only way I can think of it because I can't think of any other thing I've read this many times where it hasn't been just ingrained in my brain. But I wanted to, before we get going today, I want to just, I want to set some people's mind at ease. We're in 1 Corinthians 15. There, it is the longest chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. There's 58 verses, and we ain't going to make it through all 58 verses. That's just not going to happen today. I, I would, I, that would, uh, to sit here and, and try to make you hang on to a sermon for that long, that would almost be cruel and unusual punishment right there. And, and I want you to get something out of this thing because this first part of 1 Corinthians 15 is the most important passage of Scripture, I do believe. Uh, so let's, let's honor the reading of the Word of God. We're going to read the first 11 verses. If y'all would, let's stand and, and give honor, honor to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15. Bible's like mine. will be on page 1375. I found out today that there's actually people in here whose Bible is like mine. Miss Cindy, when I say that, her Bible is... On, is yours like that, Brittany? And your Bible's like mine, so that's great. Well, I'm, I'm tickled. Is, is anybody else in here on 1375 with me right now? Matthew! Whoa, we got, we got Bibles all over the place that are like mine. That's what I'm talking about. Now, unfortunately, I found out something bad about these Bibles while we were in, uh, in Sunday school class. If you turn to John chapter 6... Verse 66, you got a good old 666 right there in the Bible, and it scared me this morning. I flipped to it. I said, whoa, I've never noticed that before. Now I can't unsee it. So now I'm calling them. I'm like, look here, y'all need to change this. Y'all need to, y'all need to uh, click a verse over to the next page or something. Don't, don't, be, having, don't be having it like that. But uh, let's see, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, 
I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that He was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all He was seen of me, also as one uh, also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and, and His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or, so, or they, so we preach, and so ye believe." Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, God. Lord, we just thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, if there be one amongst us that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they'd come to know you before it's everlasting too late, God. Lord, we thank you for the simplicity of the gospel, Lord. We thank you that you sent your Son to die for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and rose again from the dead on the third day according to the Scriptures, God. And then if we believe that, Lord, then we are, we are as saved as saved can get, Lord. And Lord, you, you've made it crystal clear. If we reject that, we're as lost as we can be. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to trust you freely, God, and, and to, to, to not have to work our way, Lord, because we, we know we'd be, we'd be working until, until the end of time with no success, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you made a way where there was no way. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Y'all be seated. So, over the past five years, and hopefully until the Lord calls me home, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, multiple, multiple times a week. Um, because I do believe that these are the most important four verses in all of Scripture. And the Scriptures immediately following that support um, some things about it here. But we're, today we're looking at this, this long chapter. We're not going to make it through it in one day. But I want you to understand something. If you've listened to me very long at all, you'll know that these four verses, the first four verses, are included in almost every single sermon that I preach. It is, it is my job as a pastor to communicate this Word of God. The most important um, thing to be communicated in this book is that gospel message. It is your job as a Christian to, and not just my job as a pastor, it's not, I'm not the only one responsible for soul winning. That should be on every single one of us that's blood-bought and born again. Every one of us are indebted to the lost world out there to lead them to Christ. The only way you're going to lead them to Christ is through the only way He says is possible. And it's going to be through this gospel. So the importance of this message being preached over and over and over again is because the most of professing believers today do not understand the gospel and cannot communicate the gospel. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been watching John grow as a Christian recently and, and over the past year or so, and he'll have those conversations with people. And I always think it's funny because um, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to test the spirit of the person that he's talking to about Scripture, so he wants them to present the gospel to him. Hey, do you know the gospel? And you'll be surprised at the, the random things that people say, like, uh, oh, yes, everything from, uh, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We, we, we had that one the other day. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the gospel. And then I'm like, no, that's the gospels. That's four different messages here. That's, that's the good news is this man says it, this man says it, this man says it, and this man says it. But the gospel that saves, that's what Paul gives us. And so you're talking about Christians, 20-year believers, pastors that who have pastored for 20 and 40 years who can't communicate what the actual gospel is. When it's written down clear as day, it gets no more clear than the way the Apostle Paul has described it here. And 
That is why every sermon will just about point back to that. You know, these four verses, these four verses are, are something that separates a Bible-believing church from the apostate nonsense that's out there today because we give reverence to the gospel. We exalt what God exalts. Now, when you can start considering everything that, uh, that has the title Christian on it today, I, I want you to think long and hard. We've, uh, we've experienced this uh, um, a lot locally. You know, there's Christian yoga. There's, uh, there's, uh, what, cre there's Christian bars. Did y'all know that? There's Christian bars. Oh, what, a, what, a, what a shame, right? There's, um, I've already mentioned the, some of the so-called Christian music out there, the, you know, the cut and flips and nonsense. Uh, and you've got the everything is just wanting to take that name and and take to, for some they they know that that's a, there's a niche market out there for people that that would, would follow so they they want to take that name so they can take advantage of that niche market of people out there and then you you've got a generation of people now that have been so brainwashed into believing that God is something that God's not and or believing that God is only love you go listen to the Christian music now. It is, it is nothing but uh, the, the love, 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 all kinds of weird love. You've got reckless love. You've got all kinds. Reckless love, really. That's, that's, a, that's one of the dumber things I've ever heard a man say, that God was reckless. Okay. Go, go sit down, Junior. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we're going to break out some, uh, some old hymns on this one and, and let, let the hymns you know, that exalt God and not make Him out to be some type of fool uh, we're we're going we're gonna to exalt God, not, not try to exalt man to, to sell a few concert tickets there. But they take that name, Christianity, and they've smeared it in the ground. As far as I'm concerned, they can have the name. And I'll keep the doctrine, I'll keep the, I'll keep the, well, the sound doctrine, and they can have the, the counterfeit version of Christianity. We'll take, we'll take the real thing. We'll take... We'll take what it's really based on, and they can have all the things that they've, they've perverted in order to make a name for themselves, in order to elevate themselves uh, with their works and their emotions. And I'll just be happy uh, exalting the name of, D of Jesus and preaching sound doctrine. The number one way, though, that we can exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, edify the church at the same time, and glorify God all at the same time, is to boldly proclaim the gospel. Uh, the gospel, it is the only message that's saved. It, and it's, this is what makes it so important out there. Satan knows how powerful the gospel is, and he'll do everything in his, in his power to close the mouth or destroy the credibility of ones who believe that gospel message. Uh, they, they, want you, they want you silenced. They want, they want you to look ignorant. All that, all that jazz, all rolled into one. If I mean, if Satan can make it happen, now, I mean, you, you go out there and you, you go stand on the street and you preach a little, you preach the gospel for a little bit. Guess what? You're gonna have Christians come up to you and tell you you're hateful. If you went right now to Walmart, leave here, and you go, you go take a, um, take a sign up to uh, Walmart, and you hold a sign up there with the gospel on it, and you have the person beside you holding up a sign saying, "This is the only way to heaven." every other way leads to hell, you will have Christians that just left church stop you and tell you how wrong and how hateful you are. You're never going to lead anybody to Christ. This is why people don't like the church. You're going to have this over and over and over and over again. You're going to get, you're going to get spit on. You're going to get cussed out. You're, people are going to say, who's your preacher? I bet you go to Eastside. Uh, <laughs> that's probably, uh, probably what's going what's to happen there. Um, I, like our East Side shirts, like Tim and Cindy are wearing, I don't even like to wear mine out no more, man. Like people, I, like if if I get caught with, oh, I, I got this at Goodwill. <laughs> I don't, I don't want, I don't want nobody to, I don't want nobody to know uh, that I'm that guy, right? That that you've been hating on, but no, nah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. But this gospel message is so important. Satan wants to silence it, and he will use baby Christians in his plan. To silence that, and I can't tell you how how often that happens to me. Some somebody who uh, I, I call them uh, what uh, what third generation Christians, or they're three generations away from it because Grandpa was a Christian, and because Grandpa was a Christian, Daddy went to church sometimes, and they don't go to church at all. Period. Never never read scripture at all. 
but they know everything that I'm supposed to do as a pastor. They know everything that you're supposed to be as a Christian. And if you don't have that entire book memorized, you're just a sorry heathen. You're not a Christian, and you're no better than anything. I mean, this is what you're, what you're dealing with out there with people. And Satan will use those people to talk to a, a firm, just, I mean, if someone has a strong grasp on Scripture, to belittle them, to every time you try to present the gospel, you feel about this big. That's exactly what Satan wants you to, wants you to do. But what he doesn't realize is Christ can use that person who feels about that big. Christ can use that person in their humility to, to do what he would have them do. And when you'll do it like that, if you'll do it when you're humble like that, and imagine if you did blow up, and you, imagine you did get that audience eventually, if you were faithful to do it with, with them spitting on you. You were faithful to do it with, with them talking about you. When you're faithful to do it when your family turn against you. You're faithful to do it when, when they want you to uh, well, they cancel. You can't cancel me. I've already been canceled. But you, when you're faithful to do, it, to do it then, and you continue in it, and you continue in faithfulness, God's going to bless things. God's, God's going to... And you know what? what if, so what if they... Uh, if they uh, do something to, to harm you while you're there. You're, you're safe and secure in the arms of God. So what if they, if they try to make a, make a, tack, a mortal attack on your life? So, so what? You're standing there in immortality because you've already believed the gospel. You've trusted that gospel. You're, you're safe. You're secure. You can't, you can't lose it. can't be taken away. They can't spit it off of you. They can't cuss it off of you. They can't do any of that to take it away from you. All you have to do is be faithful. And there's going to come times where I'm going to tell you what, being faithful is going to be hard. And when it's hard... And not even when it's hard, but all the time, you need your brother and sisters in Christ to come alongside of you and to do, as Tim likes to talk about with, uh, with Aaron and Ben Hur, and raise your arms up a little bit and help you out. But Satan wants to destroy the credibility. He wants, he, he, if you've sinned any time in the past 400 years and one of these apostates finds out about it, man, they, they're wanting to light you up over that sin because... Uh, because they, they just they got to tear you down. They got to stop that message somehow or another. If Satan can keep that Bible believer's mouth shut and keep the message from being accepted, then he'll prevent people from hearing the gospel, and that's a win for him. The false churches have promoted salvation by works, salvation by emotionalism, salvation by feeling, salvation by heritage, and even salvation by dumb luck. Now, I'm talking about Calvinism there, because that's got to be dumb luck for you to be uh, saved and not even want it or not know you need it or anything like that. It's got to be dumb luck. But that's been perpetuated by the false church for so long, and we've got people now who are professing believers who have no concept whatsoever of the truth of the gospel. So before we get into the actual gospel message today, we need to understand why knowing it is so right. So if you mark in your Bibles... You turn to Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. This is why I harp on the gospel. This is why every pastor should harp on the gospel. This is why every Bible believer should harp on the gospel. And this is why you should take it for fact when I say to you, or when specifically when Scripture says to you uh, what the gospel is, this is why you should turn off all the other garbage, turn off all the other noise, and pay attention. Somebody say amen when you got Galatians 1, 8 and 9. Amen. All right, here we go. Amen. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That means lost, by the way. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. They said it twice right there. I mean, when, when Scripture says the ex almost verbatim exact, exact same thing, one right after another, it's probably a pretty good idea to listen to whatever, whatever's being said there. And this is why it's important. No other message saves. If anybody's believed anything else, they believe the wrong gospel written to a different group of people for a different time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those Gospels were written to the Jews. I want you to hear what I'm saying. They were written to the Jews. Yes, they were written to, to some Gentiles as well. What Paul is writing to us is specifically written 
to the church and how we can know that we're saved. And we know that it's only one way because Paul says any other gospel unto you uh, that we, other than we've preached unto you, let them be accursed. And I want to give you a spoiler alert for those that want to actually rightly divide Scripture and study it out. There is at least ten gospels in Scripture. This is the only one that saves in the church age. Uh, if, you, if you want some more information on that, I'm happy to give that to you. But gospel does not actually, it's not always pointing to this message. Um, gospel always means good news. But this is the good news that saves. There's other gospels. There's gospels of the kingdom. There's, uh, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's, um, there's, so technically there's 14 gospels if you count Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as individual gospels. But that, that is a, that's one of those deep dives that we can, we can look at here. And I don't encourage you to take any of that for fact. Go study that out for yourself. You don't need me to, uh, to give you the facts on it. You can get it from, from the book itself. You get it straight from the source. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Let's look at it closely. Uh, well, knowing, first off, knowing that this message is so important, um, or knowing that the gospel, or knowing that gospel, and having that ingrained in your, in your heart there and believing that gospel is so important because not knowing it is an automatic death sentence. Automatic. Knowing it, though, See, this is the kicker. Tim, you always talk about that 12-inch conversion from here to here. Knowing the gospel up here is one thing. Knowing that gospel here is another thing. When you, when you make that 12-inch conversion and you actually believe that gospel and you actually trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you've, when you've given yourself over to Him and you make that conversion, that's where salvation happens at. That's, that's where... That's where we know that we know that we know that we're saved. Now, believing the gospel here, that's not a guaranteed life sentence either. You could still be having a death sentence unless you've actually believed the gospel. Knowing it's one thing, devils know it. Demons know it. I mean, I have, I have no doubt that you can, you can go to the jailhouse right now people that are as lost as lost can be. And, I'm, and there's safe people in jail. Safe people do some wild stuff. I, I've done some stuff recently. I probably should have gone, out, you know, gone to jail. I'm just playing. Maybe. I don't know. But, um, I've definitely done a few things that the statute of limitations might not have run out on yet. But uh, well, that's a story for another time, Tim. So, but you go down to the jailhouse. There's plenty of them down there who are as lost as Adam's house cat, who know the gospel, who've heard the gospel, maybe even read the gospel, but never believed the gospel. Never, never trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So not knowing it is an automatic death sentence, but knowing it is not an automatic life sentence. You've got to believe it as well. Believing the gospel is the only requirement to dwell in heaven for eternity. Not believing the, the gospel is the only requirement for spending an eternity trespassing in a devil's hell. And I say trespassing. Scripture says trespassing because it wasn't made for you. It was made for Him. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. We're going to go, um, we're going to go fast here, as fast as y'all listen. Moreover, brethren, so we got brethren. We know that Paul's talking to the church here. He's talking to saved people. Um, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. He's already preached it to them before. Also ye have received. Paul knows they've believed it before. Wherein ye stand... He knows they believed it. He knows they're standing in it. Here's, here it is, number two. By which also are ye saved? This is important to know because this is how salvation works here. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, some people like to say, well, look, you've got to actually remember all that. No, he says, remember back. I've already preached this to you. Don't, don't try to make the Bible say stuff it doesn't say. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The Gospel has those five parts in it. You've, uh, you've got three big parts, and then you've got one part repeated twice. You've got Christ dying for our sins, and when He died for our sins, we've got to believe that, but then the very next phrase says, according to the Scriptures... According to the Scriptures, Christ has died for our sins, past, present, and future. He's made, he's made a, a one-time offer that will cover us for all time. So He's died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 
He was buried according to the Scriptures. He rose from the dead on the, he rose from the grave on the third day according to the Scriptures. So when we use that, when we have that phrase according to the Scriptures, we're not talking about according to church tradition. We're not talking about according to... And we're actually going to get into a couple of things that verified it, but we're not even talking about the testimony of men here. We're talking about according to the Word of God this happened. This is the most... This is the most authoritative document on the planet. You ever get into a debate with a, with someone over over uh, God or religion? The last thing they want you to do is actually use Scripture because they know, hey, that's where the authority lies. So we've got to we've got to take out the the final authority and let's use the authorities of men to justify these things. But we our fate is according to Scripture. If your fate is according to anything else, if your fate is according to the science, maybe you went up and saw the. Uh, the, the ark up in Kentucky, and maybe you saw how beautiful and magnificent it was, and maybe you saw the ocean and saw how great and beautiful it was, because there's got to be a creator, right? And maybe, maybe you saw that and said, hey, you know what, I believe because, hey, how did this thing come together? I believe because of this. Do you believe according to the Scripture? According to the Scripture, not according to anything else. Not according to anything that's in the Library of Congress other than this book, because I, I do believe this book is in the Library of Congress. I, I don't think it's been read in a while, but I, I do believe that it's there. Let's see. Now this next session, uh, section here, we're going to get into the, uh, the proofs of the gospel that are included inside of 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 5, And that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve, that's the other disciples. And first off, I want to point out something to you here. Um, Judas was already dead. So the order of this had taken place, you have Peter seeing it. And Peter wasn't the first one. We know, uh, we know the Mary saw him there at the grave. Um, but this is the ones we're talking about here. This is the, the testimony here of, the, of these guys because their testimony mattered. Seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. So this is, this is the time period has passed. They've already elected Matthias there. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present. So these 500 people saw Jesus Christ after He was resurrected from the grave. They saw Him, and by the time Paul was writing uh, this letter of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, most of those people were still alive. That testimony has remained unchallenged. Most of them are still alive there. After that, he was seen of James. Now, I do believe this is speaking of uh, James, his brother, and not James Zebedee, because I do believe Zebedee was probably dead at this point. Then, all of the apostles... So this goes beyond the twelve disciples there. This goes to, to the apostles that sat directly under those twelve disciples who would also have seen Jesus as, re, uh, as He was resurrected. Verse 8, And last of all, He was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So out of all the people that have seen Him, the last one here... Over 500 is the Apostle Paul, and he's claiming that. Now, according to anybody, uh, I like it when Franz is here when I use a word like this, uh, but does anybody know what jurisprudence means? Let me tell you, I've never. You know what it means? No, don't look it up. I got the definition here. And, no, no, I can tell you. Yeah, Y'all ought to be um, happy with yourselves. You've never had to go to court very much, so, and, it, and that shows. But, but maybe watch Law and Order every now and then so you can learn a little, little something about the law here. But jurisprudence is the theory or philosophy of law. And I, I'm bringing that up today because of how the gospel message actually works and the, author, the authority of it. Now, in the long run, in the grand scheme of things, what I'm about to tell you makes no difference. It has no effect on the gospel whatsoever. But let me, I want to show you what it does have an effect on here. According to jurisprudence, the verbal testimony that's of people that's been recorded in writing um, and not challenged is preserved. It's, you can't, it can't be overruled. So when you take something to court, let's say... Um, let's, let's say me and John and Frank and Tim, we all were in, went to court and we testified for something. And, you know, courts have a stigno, uh, stenographer now where they're, they're typing everything down. This is why. Once what you say is entered into evidence and it's not refuted, nobody, nobody says, they don't bring anything to the table saying that it's, that, it's not, that it's not the truth. It's entered into evidence then at that point. 
And if you ever have to go back to court for it, guess what? We don't have to go back and testify. Now they'll pull up our statement and say, well, this is what was, uh, this is what was said. And no lawyer can get that thrown out because it was allowed to go in. It was, it, they, they said, hey, this is good. This testimony is good. So we're going to set it aside. So jurisprudence, they can't throw it out. It's there, it's there forever unless it can be proved to be factually incorrect then it can be removed. That's, that's how that would work. Now, based on the written testimony of Jesus Christ, the written testimony of folks that have written about Him, um, based off of that, based off the fact that, uh, of, of the gospel, based off the fact that these people had seen Him and there's witness account of it, that is evidence that even a court of law couldn't overturn. So if you were to actually put Jesus' resurrection on trial, there's not an honest court that would be able to take these facts that were recorded and overturn them. So one thing about the King James Bible is it's written under the authority of a sitting king. This thing is set in stone right here. It can't be overturned without evidence to overturn it. So what would it take to overturn um, this message? I'm going to tell you, could it be overturned? Absolutely. This could be overturned. It would require a body, though. It would require a body, a skeleton of Jesus Christ. They'd have to have a skeleton, and they'd have to prove it was Jesus Christ. That's the only way possible for a court of law even to determine that this gospel account isn't true. But guess what? Who cares? It doesn't matter what the court of law can do. or It, it doesn't matter when science agrees with Scripture. That just proves that science is finally coming around a little bit. It, it doesn't matter if the law agrees with the Word of God. It just means they're coming around a little bit. It, it makes no never mind whatsoever. As a believer, though, there are two things that you need to know, of, that you need to know about. And the first is that nothing the law says makes this book any truer. It makes, nothing makes it any less true. Second, well, this goes along with it. God doesn't need a court of law to verify His Word. Why, why, would, why would God, who is above that court, need that court to verify what He said? The second thing is if you ever find yourself in a conversation where the burden is on you to prove either the existence or deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can use this testimony for proof of one thing. You can use it to prove that those who deny the existence of God do so by ignoring the evidence. They, they don't want to talk about the evidence that's out there. They, they, you can go to this and you can see, like we were talking about in Sunday school today, you can see that even if God comes down from heaven and or if the Holy Spirit ascends like a dove, and God said, opens up heaven and says, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Even then, they hear it from heaven. Even if they watch Him uh, bring Lazarus out of the grave. Even if they see Him after He's been dead and in the grave for three days, they're still not going to believe because they refuse to see the evidence. Y'all seen that show on Netflix? I think it's called Bird Box, where they put the, uh, the, the, thing, the things up right there. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's exactly... What, uh, what folks are doing. They're walking around with their eyes closed. They're, they're blind as bats and they're happy to be blind. Outside of you and I being witnesses of the work of the Holy Spirit uh, for what the Holy Spirit's done in our lives and the evidence written down for us in the book, it is not our place to convince folks that God is real. And Christians have got off on this tangent of thinking that, that, that your responsibility is to is to prove God's existence. No, that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to spread the gospel. If they don't want to hear the gospel, move on and spread it with the next person. Don't stand there and try to beat them over the head until they believe. I mean, do, you, do you understand what happened to Pharaoh and what happened to the Egyptians? And you think you stand there with a, with a, with a wad of paper and wrapped in leather and you're going to be able to tap that person on the head hard enough to get them to believe? No. And besides, God says they're without excuse already. Our job is no different than the 500 plus individuals who saw Jesus resurrected from the grave. Our job as Christians are to be a witness of what we know, 
not trying to prove things that we don't even fully understand. If you, you can know that God is real. You can believe that God is real. But I guarantee you're not going to be able to explain God to an atheist to the point where the atheist believes. They reject because they want to reject. They reject because of this. They're blind. And if you don't believe so, you, know, you might be blind just some different ways. We're to be witnesses. We're not God's lawyers. We're His witnesses. I got a typo in here, and it's a bad one. Mm. But that happens from time to time. Probably because the young ones run up to the computer and, and just type garbage, whatever. But I got to make out what I typed here because I think this was, this was Waylon. Waylon, don't touch my computer again. So, what we have going on in the church today, we've got a lot of people who refuse to do what they're supposed to do, who refuse to be witnesses for Christ. we got a lot of God-called people that... There, there's so many men sitting in pulpits, in, or sitting not in pulpits, but in pews and churches that will never answer that call to preach, who, who've been called to do it. And they use every excuse. Now, deacons are worse. Man, you, you call somebody, you ask somebody to be a deacon. I'm going to tell you now. You're going you gonna to get the old brother, let me pray on it things. Let me do this. Let me do that. Uh, you, want, you want a man to leave the church? Ask him to be a deacon. Ask him. You'll see what happens. Especially uh, in a church where you got problems with deacons. Now, y'all ever been there where you, you know, there's problems going on? And honestly, if there's problems going on, I don't want to be on the deacon board either. But when you've got a Bible-believing church where the deacons actually serve in the capacity that the Bible requires them to do, man, you'll, you'll get them too. Like, people get uncomfortable. I just don't think I can do it. So then what happens is you don't have qualified men that are willing to step up. Then what happens, you know, you've got things going on like you need Sunday school taught, you need this or you need that, and you don't have qualified people to step up. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, if you're in here and you see that there's a need in the church like that, you need to be talking to your pastor and you need to be finding out if we can get you uh, serving at some place. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It ha the same thing that happens in every, in every church. Somebody's going to start coming to that church one day. And that person's going to be highly unqualified for that position. But that person's going to covet that position. They're going to want that position because they're going to want a little bit of authority in the church. They're going to be able to say, oh, I teach Sunday school down at this one. Or I do this or I do that. They're going to want that. What we had happen here in this church, and thank God I had enough discernment to not let it happen, we, we had a guy come in want to want to mess with the children, want to teach the children. We had a known pedophile. Guess what? We didn't have anybody dealing with the children. Do you know there's churches around here that would say, hey, go on, thank God, you, you can come help with the kids. They'll do it. It could have easily have happened here when you don't have people stepping up to, to do what they're... What they're um, to serve. So you need to be looking for opportunities to serve. And, and I speak that from, from experience there. When I was these kids' age, I had somebody trying to take advantage of our youth group that I was going to. And we would go back in the back. The preacher had no idea what was going on. He thought the guy was on the up and up. Nobody else volunteered to do it. And they, they got the, the biggest apostate around to come in there not knowing anything about him. And he started teaching us some, some terrible, terrible stuff. I mean, we were back there in the church, in, in the church, and he was having the kids go back and forth telling their favorite racist jokes and things like that. I mean, that's, that's uncalled for. If you want to do that at home, do it at home if you want to. Don't bring that into the church. Don't bring that in here teaching, teaching kids different things. You know, we, we go home all the time with these impressionable children that pick up things just from the kids. I don't need them picking up things from the adult that they've, that's been put in, they've been put in the charge of. But what I need is, and what every pastor needs is for men to step up and do the role that, that they are called to do before somebody else steps up. I'm going to tell you right now, you need to be heavenly focused. You need to be focused on that judgment seat of Christ. You need to be focused on what crowns you're going to lay down. There is some apostate walking around in some church somewhere wearing somebody's crown and, and it doesn't fit 
they're just getting it dirty and it's wasteful and they're, they're, you're going to wind up having people that are hurt and never come back to church because something happens to them in the church. And those things would not happen near as often if people would just do what God has called them to do there. We're almost done here. Verse 9 says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. So we're getting into some pretty, uh, pretty good doctrine here. Uh, there is a false teaching uh, here that verse 9 helps clear up for us. And to be clear, I don't believe that this false teaching has any effect on salvation, but the people that are on the opposite side of this false teaching, for some reason they do believe it has an effect on salvation. So according to them, if you believe them like me, you're lost. But according to me, I, I, I think they just don't understand the text. Let's see, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop them from being dogmatic about it, though. Verse 9, we're going to file it under right division. Um, the false teaching here is that the church didn't begin until the middle of the book of Acts in chapter 9. And for some reason, that, people make that a salvation issue. This is known as mid-Acts theology or hyper-dispensationalism, if you want to make a note of that. But let's look at what Paul says. He says, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So the basis of this hyper-dispensationalism is that the church did not have its start until Acts chapter 9 when Paul was saved. And I'm going to turn over there for you and I'm going to read Acts chapter, um, chapter 9 verses 1 through 16. So y'all listen quick here. This is why it's important to rightly divide the word because you'll get all kinds of people out there trying to teach you all kinds of things. And they, they do it knowing that Scripture doesn't say what they try to teach. And I, don't, I'm, I can't understand them. So we, you, if you don't know, before Paul came to Christ, his name was Saul. Uh, so we're talking here about him. Verse 9, And Saul, yet breathing, breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And so this is, this is literally Saul, Paul, um, getting permission to persecute the church. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, uh, uh, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished, and he trembled, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and that shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord, uh, said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is, called, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Taurus. For behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And there he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord saith unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. All right. So here we've got the last account of Paul actually um, seeking to, pro to persecute anyone. After this point, he has not persecuted anyone for being a Christian. Verse 9, I'm going to go back and read it. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So the false teaching that's out there is that the, the church didn't start until Paul started it. So who did he persecute then? What church did he persecute if, if, uh, if he was persecuting people and he didn't persecute anybody after the fact? 
I don't think there's much more that needs to be said to prove that that, that, that Acts chapter 9 is not where the church started. It's where Paul was saved at. But we got one more proof here. Romans 16 and 17. Salute Andr Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now, this is the same Paul. He's saying these people were in Christ before me. You're either in Christ or not in Christ. Paul wasn't in Christ. They were in Christ. They were part of the church before Paul was. But you literally have churches built around this doctrine for some reason, and they look at churches that believe otherwise as, hey, you're lost and going to hell, and, you know, whatever, man. At least we believe Scripture. If we're, go if we're going to hell, we're going to believe in Scripture. We're not going because we believe the Gospel, but, hey, we're at least believing the book here. Verse 10, let's go on. But by the grace of God, I am that I am, and His grace which was bestowed unto me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Paul is the greatest example of a Christian that I know to point you to. Paul knows everything that he was able to do by laboring for the Lord was by the grace of God. It was, a, it was literally a product of the grace that God gave him. The Apostle Paul knew that his future was secured. He knew it by believing the gospel. And because his future was secure, he was able to labor more than any other of the apostles out there. This, this message of, of the gospel, it was given to Paul. He was, he was the one that received it. And then he started carrying that message. He was the first one with it. He's, he's literally he's, he's the, the guide arm bearer. He's, the, he's, he's holding the flag up. He's, he was secure. He knew he was secure. And people, people like to say a lot of times that Paul had some, uh, some suicidal tendencies. But he, had some, he looked like he was uh, trying to get himself hurt or something like that. And I, I personally believe that what Paul got to see, what Paul, Paul knew how glorious it would be in heaven, he knew his eternity was secure. He was able to actually live right now. I use this illustration quite a bit, and I, I want to use it today. I, I want you to think about your Christian life in, the, in this light here. My parents, they went years and years and years not doing anything, saving money, saving money, saving money, saving money, looking forward to retirement, right? When they finally retired, they started doing things. They, they wasted the best part of their life not doing things. They, and then now they're doing things in their older age. And, and my dad, he'll go somewhere now and he'll fall asleep. Y'all saw mom in here at the baby shower. She's asleep, right? Just falling out. They, they're, they, they're prepared for their, their golden years, right? To to go through and, and use that money wisely. Now, when you're, when you're raising a family and stuff, you try to, you try to pour into them. You want, you want them set up, right, so, that, so they can start off a little better than you are. And, you know, it'd be nice if everybody just had a big old lump sum of money they could throw to their kids and their kids never have to worry about anything. Their future would be secure. That'd be great if my family would do that and just the future would be completely secure, never have to worry about anything, never, never have to, to, to think twice about what's going to happen, where that next meal is going to come from, or anything like that. That's not the case for most people. For a Christian, that is the case for you spiritually. For a Christian, your future, your eternity is secure. You're going to be with God in glory forever. So why not take advantage of the time that you have now and live for God now? Don't hush up the message. Don't wait until you get into your golden years when you're about to, when you're about to kick the bucket and, and you've got nothing left to lose. Do it right now. Right now, serve God with your full heart. Serve, I mean, serve Him with everything that you've got. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Don't wait until your body is old and frail. I mean, praise God for people that come to Christ in their old age. But man, glory to God for those that come at a young age. And don't waste that next 60 years not doing anything productive for the Lord. 
we have got to be focused on that judgment seat and what it means to lay down crowns at the feet of Jesus. We need to be focused on that because if you don't take the opportunity to do it, somebody else is going to take the opportunity to indoctrinate your friend or your child or your family member and it's going to be too late for them. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to look back on that thing and you're going to have a lot of I wish I would have. And I can't tell you as a, well, I can tell you as a, as a preacher and as a, just a Christian in general, I've buried a lot of friends that I wish I would have. I wish I would have taken that opportunity. I've buried family that I, that I did take the opportunity and it didn't take because nobody in the previous, um, previous generations planted any seeds. It got to a point where the seeds were getting planted uh, while the ground was already rocky. But you plant that seed now, you till the, you till the ground now before it's everlasting too late. It's, it's simple. The, the gospel message is a simple message. If you've never believed, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you can do that today. You can have your eternity secure. All you've got to do is believe that Jesus Christ has died for your sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And if you'll believe that, your eternity will be secure. You'll be standing in immortality until God calls you home. If you haven't believed that, you're dead where you sit. I pray that you would, would come to believe that. If you've got family that doesn't believe that, I pray that you would, you would take the opportunity as someone who does believe it to witness to them. It's going to be painful. You're going to feel about this big. They're probably going to reject you. But if you don't try, that's on you. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names. God, we thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. Lord, and as I've stood here today, Lord, this has been one of the hardest sermons for me to preach. I know that I, I can just I can feel feel Satan just trying to torment me, God. My back's hurt the whole time. My tongue's felt like it's going to fall off. Lord, it just the message is important because it's about your gospel. I didn't didn't save it on the thing. I almost got here without it. And praise God, you, you, uh, you allowed the opportunity for me to remember it, Lord. Lord, I can tell you, Satan's been all over this thing. I'm surprised he didn't make the baby come, Lord. Because that's how important this message is, that he would try to interrupt it that way. Lord, I just ask you, Lord, if there be some that, that doesn't believe this gospel, either in the room or by social media, Lord, I pray that they would believe it before it's everlasting too late, Lord. Lord, and I thank you for, for all the opportunities that you, that you gave me, Lord. I thank you for, I thank you, Lord, that I, that I did decide to believe, Lord. Lord, and I thank you for, for all those men, Lord, that you'll call to, uh, to preach your word, Lord. And I pray that they preach this gospel the way that you've told us to preach it, God. Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If y'all got business to do with the Lord, the altar is open. Mm-hmm.